Uh, today we've got Todd Herman uh, on our podcast. Uh, really excited about this. The, the author of The Alter Ego and working with top performers and uh, athletes, uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs. Uh, and I just came across your uh, a podcast on the Flow Research Collective uh, that you did about six months ago. Really fascinating stuff that you spoke about. So I have a thousand questions, Todd, but I'll let you talk about your background and how how all this come into play because uh, yeah. just the headline all three goes super exciting so uh, let's kick it off yeah uh well thanks guys great to be here too um and love love all the work that uh you guys are up to as well and uh, we were talking just beforehand about how we, we had, were attacking essentially the same problem just with different tools that we're trying to give people um so there's tons of overlap but you know my background just super quickly for the people that are listening um is i started a uh peak performance and mental game coaching company back in 1997, long before coaching was even a thing. Um, it was uh, maybe a struggle to get it off the ground. That's kind of a lesson in when you're starting out a business, it's far easier to just go with something that's known sometimes. But, um, and and that got started simply because I was, uh, you know, I grew up in Canada on a big farm and ranch and uh, loved playing sport basically as an activity that I could get away from doing uh, work on the farm. So I tried to play as many sports as I could. Um, had a bunch of football scholarships uh, um, going into college. I was a national ranked bad badminton player as well. Um, people are always like American football and badminton. Those two seem to really go along really well. But uh, anyway, um, I, I was a good athlete, not because of my physical prowess. I'm not 6'4", 245 pounds but it was more because of my mental game approach that I had to things. Um, so my attitudes uh, that I take onto the field. Um, and so when I got done playing myself, I got into the world of like coaching young athletes, like at a high school. And I'd spend a lot of time with them and telling them, listen, you don't need to do more cone drills. You don't need to do more wind sprints. And so that's not going to help you out there. Cause really your deficit is that you're just not preparing very well. And so I was giving them some of my strategies and they started really working with them. And uh, parents started asking me if I could mentor their sons and daughters. And it turned into an accidental business for me. And, uh, you know, I loved what I did. I loved working with the athletes, young athletes, and just kept on spiraling up and getting uh, more and more clients. And I'm a product of mentorship. I believe very deeply in apprenticing with other people. So I would always go and approach like, who's the number one mental game guy in the world? Well, it was Harvey Dorfman. He literally wrote the Bible of the industry called Coaching the Mental Game. It's kind of known as the Yoda of Major League Baseball, worked with all Major League Baseball players. So I went and spent 33 days with him. I got to see what he, it was like working with pro athletes. He started sending me clients. And just long story, getting to the alter ego stuff is as my business was getting into the upper echelons of Olympic athletes and pro athletes, um, this common thread was weaving amongst the best of the best. Now, again, I was working in 86 sports. So whether it was by athletes from Finland, um, whether it was table tennis or ping pong players in Italy, or whether it was uh, NBA basketball players or whatever. Like I was just across the zone because I wasn't helping them with their actual skill, like of playing. I was helping them with navigating the mental and the emotional side of it, like developing that resiliency. And um, they would bring up, I've got this secret identity. I've got this persona I step into. I've got this alter ego that I have when I go out there. And it just sort of toppled a bunch of dominoes in my own head because I did the exact same thing. And so I started investigating it more. I'd interview my clients, say, well, how do you get into it? And this is how I did it. And this is how others are doing it. And I created this method. And um, you know, if you know anything about business, people talk about niching a lot, like find your niche. Well, I can tell you that when you're known as the alter ego guy, that's pretty ultimate niche, but it's the thing that blew up my company. Um, because one thing about alter egos or identity-based performance is everything um, about you is, is layered on top of how you see yourself. So that's your identity. And um, what I became known, known as is basically the quick hit guy. If you needed to change now because you were playing at the US Open in Flushing Meadows, New York on Saturday, and it's a Wednesday, I would raise, raise, my, raise my hand and say, no, 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 that, give me that job. That's the one that I want. I want, to, I want to be forced to help someone transform in just three days, which is typically not what other people really want, you know, to, to place the pressure on themselves with because, but I could do it because I had this tool 
Because the moment you disassociate from yourself, the moment you no longer play through your own narrative of who you think you are, and you play through a new narrative, and you associate yourself with something different, a new idea, all bets are off on what can happen to your behavior, your habits, your attitude. So um, do, do you have a concrete example just because that's yeah. what I found so fascinating. I used to play professional tennis myself and uh, underperformance, you know, that happened yeah. a bunch of times. How do you, can you even take a concrete example? Because uh, it would be fascinating to know, because like you said, most things take time, very long time. Yeah. Well, I'll give you one of someone as a young kid, actually. Um, so uh, he's 13 years old. Um, you know, and in that period of time, like in that age group, uh, a, a big thing that's affecting performance for, for young teenagers is whether or not you've hit your puberty yet. Like, you know, someone else is 13 and they've got a mustache and you're looking at them going, man, I don't even have one single little hair underneath my armpit yet. Mm -hmm. um, and now they're seven inches taller than you. They're getting muscle mass on top of them. And so there's this great divide that starts to happen in that age group. And so this young guy that I was, uh, that I was uh, working with was always a really good baseball player. Just like one of those kids you want on your team because he's super coachable, like almost like very much a captain type kid, great attitude. And um, he came back from a tournament in Georgia. He lived up in the New York area where I was at. And he, uh, I could just tell that he was down, which was very weird for him. And, and I said, so what's going on? He's like, well, when I was down there, every single guy was like, six foot two or six foot, or they were big. Like there's, and he said, there's a guy in the house, he had a mustache. And uh, immediately I was like, this is someone who is giving up their own power to something outside of them, right? That's one of the things that you look for in performance is where are people creating weakness in their own sense of power or identity or self because they're placing so much uh, power onto something outside of them, right? That, that guy's five inches taller than me. That means nothing to me. Like in my own cycle, it means nothing to me, how big you are, how much money you have, how tall you are, how much better hair that you have. Cause you've got a better hairline than me. Those things just don't matter to me. Um, now it took me a long time to get there. I'll say that. So I said to him, um, isn't that fascinating? What a great opportunity for you. And he was like, wait, what? And I was like, you have got this amazing opportunity because while you're looking at them and you're seeing someone big, they're looking at you and what they might, what, what might they be seeing? And he's like, well, that I'm short. And that like, you know, my, my baseball uniform kind of drapes off of me because they can't find one even small enough for me. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. And now I know that well, because I never hit my growth spurt until I was about 14. I was always the smallest kid in my class, all that but I never played to that. That's some that's because I had two older brothers. So I was always kind of fighting for my own role in uh, my own family. And uh, I just wouldn't quit. My parent, my brothers just found me so terribly annoying because I just wouldn't quit. I wouldn't shut up. I wouldn't stop. I wouldn't chat, stop challenging them. And I said, so what a great opportunity for you because they're going to underestimate you just like you're overestimating them. But I said, um, who is someone that is just, that if you could take them to the plate, like if that was the person that was actually, or if that was the being that was going up to the plate, um, who wouldn't even be thinking that thought about that player being bigger than you? So it, it's an important distinction. The, the, the question is like, who couldn't even think the thought that that guy's bigger than me? And so after a little bit of coaching with them, um, he was like, oh, well, someone that's probably bigger than them. And I'm like, exactly. That's, that's, that's a great example. And so um, there's a famous kind of mythological character over here in North America called Paul Bunyan. And um, Paul Bunyan is uh, this lumberjack. He's used as a caricature on a lot of like, say, northern U.S. or southern Canadian uh, towns with this big lumberjack, big axe over his shoulder. He stands 16 foot tall and all that. And um, now this uh, young client, Andrew, he didn't know anything about Paul Bunyan. So um, 
I was kind of explaining like what it would be like if Paul Bunyan was going to the plate. And now he didn't know anything about Paul Bunyan. So I said, before, I want you to go and learn everything that you can about Paul Bunyan tonight. I want you to go to Wikipedia, whatever, just do a search for Paul Bunyan and the myth of Paul Bunyan. And so he called me as soon as class was over the next day, called me at four o'clock and he's like, holy cow, did you know that Paul Bunyan, he was rattling off all these stats about Paul Bunyan. And, um, and I said, okay, imagine if Paul Bunyan was the one who was going to the plate. Imagine if you were stepping into Paul Bunyan, that's who's going up there. And the awesome thing about it is they don't even know that Paul Bunyan's coming to the plate. All they're seeing is this four foot, nine inch tall kid. So now you've got a superpower that they don't even know about, but that's who's going to the plate. Now, can you commit? You think you could commit to being Paul Bunyan at the plate. And before you do, I want you to tell me what is the extra special little artifact, the totem, the tool, the, the uniform that you're going to put on to step into Paul Bunyan. Because Paul Bunyan isn't out on the field. Paul Bunyan isn't out there catching the fly balls and all that. He's the one who goes to the plate. And so we settled on a, um, a, a wrist uh, sweat guard, right? Like, you know, those sweat guards are going. And on yep. the inside, it said Big Paul. And he would, he had that in his bag. And when it's his turn to go to the bat, he would slip on that um, wristband. And I mean, I go in the book about why having a uniform or totem or artifact is so important and how to honor that thing. And uh, so he did. Okay. So his issue with me was on a Monday because I was after the weekend tournament. And that was when our call was. He called me the next day on the Tuesday to talk about the Paul Bunyan thing that he just learned all about. And his next game was on a Thursday. He went uh, four for four at the plate with four home runs. Okay, well, that's a pretty insane stat alone, but that's not where it ends. He hit 23 consecutive home runs over the next, I think it was six games or something like that. Um, and his dad called me after like game number two and he said, what have you done to this kid? Because he is a different kid out there. And I'm like, he should be because he is a different kid. You're looking at the same body, but that body is now embodying a very different idea of what it can do. He has a new idea of what is capable, born out of him shackling himself to a better concept because his current self-concept was anchored to I'm smaller, which means I'm weaker and they're bigger. Now his self-concept was now anchored to I'm big. They don't even know I'm big, which is giving me a massive advantage at the plate. Mm. I think it's great stuff. It's very interesting, Todd. Um, I can imagine myself as a 14 year old and uh, say somebody is saying to me, pretend that you're Superman. Mm -hmm. and I'm pretending that I'm Superman. But then it comes up to the event and here I'm saying to myself, oh shit, I'm no more. I'm no longer Superman. Self-doubt creeps in. How do, you, how do you kind of navigate that? How do you make sure that that person is absolutely on track and stays yeah. that way all the way through? Yeah. Even if somebody else gives them a criticism or tries to knock them off. So there's two things that are going on there. One is pr preparation. So in... in all of my trainings, it was one of the very first things that I implemented with, um, with athletes back in 97. And it still carries through today as kind of one of my five, you know, core pillar ideas that I want to give to people is the positive power of negative preparation. Positive power uh, of negative. The positive power of negative preparation. preparation. So one of the great myths about the mental game which is born out of just terrible self-help books that are out there that are written by people who've never actually worked with or coached the most elite humans on the planet, right? Like I built out and worked with Real Madrid, and the South African Springboks and the Danish Olympic team, the German soccer federation has been licensing um, um, our material for, you know, going on almost 18 years now. Um, Yankees, you, you name it. And there's a very different world that elite performers, operate inside of it, how they think um, versus 
the world that is typically found in self-help books, which is typically written by people who are above average coaching average people to become really above average. They're actually creating ceilings, paradigms in your own mind that are just categorically going to prevent performance from happening. And so one of them is this idea of uh, positive affirmation, being super positive about yourself, extraordinarily optimistic. Well, in my experience, the best of the best are very good at thinking negatively, very good at thinking negatively in that they prepare themselves for negative events and situations that will happen or may happen, but they've prepared themselves positively for how they're going to respond instead of react. Because if you only think about what's always going to happen, the good things, the amazing things, and you don't prepare yourself for the fact that at some point in time, like Mike Tyson says, you're going to get punched in the mouth. And now your plan, let's see how strong that plan is. So I like punching people in the mouth as their coach or in my training programs and stuff. Like if anything, I want you to leave that event that you might come, come to pretty beaten up, bloodied and bruised. Because the great thing about preparing you that way is when you get onto the real world, it's actually less frightening than that world that I just had you inside of because I prepared you so well. It's not as hard out there as Todd just made it out to be because I'm prepared. So the positive power of negative preparation is, is what you were just unpacking. You know, if you were Superman, then you get a thing and then doubt creeps in. No, no, no. Let's prepare you for when that doubt does creep in or let's prepare you for when that other uh, competitor does trash talk you or say something to you. Okay. Like there's all these sorts of different, and there's just a response. I'm responding. Oh, you just said something. Boom. This trigger just happens. I'm responding back to that thing. And I'm not giving any of my emotional resiliency up to you um, because I've prepared myself for that moment. The second thing that is um, critically important, which is why we use totems, artifacts, and uniforms, something that you can wear, because in that moment, because you're, you're saying, I'm going to show up as Superman. Now, some people just say that stuff, but in my world, you better mean it. Because a part of the method that I talk about in the book, one of the things that is, makes it so powerful is the idea of honoring something. That's why I can't sell alter egos off of a shelf. Because who you resonate with, because of your own history, your own experience, where you come from, you know, just some random book that you read and there was a character in it that you love. And I've never even heard of this person before, but it's just, that's me. That's who I want to be out there. Um, well, that's, that's your own emotional connection. I'm not going to question that. The only thing I want to uh, um, check in on is, is that idea that you're stepping into going to help you in that performance out there on that field? And so if Superman is the person that you're really connected to, and then you get into that moment of competition and you start having that self-doubt creep in, well, let's just say that you did have that sweatband on your wrist. You better take that sweatband off because you're dishonoring Superman because Superman would never think that way. Superman would never let that doubt creep in. So you better take that off. And so what I'm talking about there is what elite people do better than everyone else is they honor something that's been lost now, especially in the last 50, 60, 80 years. We've gone into this kind of world of rote habit and routine. Here's what I can tell you. At the world of the, the peak top performers, we really care about rituals. Because rituals is taking something that you're doing, but it's got story to it. It's got narrative to it. And we are emotional beings. We are storytelling narrative beings. It'd be wonderful if we weren't, because then we could just do you know, ones and zeros and be very robotic, but we are not. We are ritualistic at that elite level. And so that ritual of knowing that when I slide on that wristband, or in this case, you know, if people you know you're listening right now, but I've gone on a pair of glasses, I don't need glasses. I've got 2015 vision. I've got perfect vision, but I went out when I was, 21, and I was terribly insecure about the fact that I had a baby face, a young looking guy starting this business. Who's going to listen to me when I'm up, up, up on that stage? Right. You know, I should have seven letters behind my name because I've got eight degrees and four best selling books. And I was creating all these rules in my head of when, it, when I was going to have the competency and the believability for someone to trust the words that I was saying, despite the fact I cared more about helping young athletes perform than the people who did have six degrees and three books behind their names. Because I love sport. 
I loved talking about this stuff. I was not, did I have all the skills yet? No, but I could overcompensate for all of that lack of skill for the fact that I cared way more than everyone else. I stayed up way later reading and studying and just making sure that the stuff that I was working with people on was actually born out of practicality. So that ritual, but going back to the glasses though, but if I, these glasses were born out of me putting the composite of three of my heroes together to help me as a, as the business person that I wanted to be, which was Joseph Campbell, who wrote Hero of the Thousand Faces, invented the hero's journey model, amazing mythologist, Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of the founding fathers of America. I've read his biography now close to over a hundred times and Superman as well. And so it was my reverse Superman. So he put on those glasses to become Clark Kent, the mild mannered person who could go around in society unknown. I put them on to step into, that was my cape. But if I ever found myself doubting myself, not being articulate, not acting confidently and decisively, which were the skills that I really wanted to adopt from my heroes, those glasses had to come off because I was not, I was not showing up like the name I gave myself, which was Super Richard. But it was just that act alone. It's that trigger. It's that triggering mechanism of turning an off and on to get to your point about how, what, what do you do in that moment? You switch it. You switch it. That is fascinating. And as uh, in, if you take breath work, uh, for example, if you have a top performing CEO mm -hmm. that wants to adopt breath work, but doesn't have, they haven't adopted breath work yet. So you have to adopt the identity that you, you feel comfortable with showing everybody at the office, not in some, in some basement somewhere and not talking about it, but actually showing up saying, Hey, listen, I'm taking 30 minutes now to do breath work in my office where everybody can walk past and see them doing it. Yeah. What do you, I know it's off the cuff here, but do you have any suggestions what, how you build on top of that? Because it's, it, if you're a guy up here, a top performing CEO, you may not want to be people looking at you on the floor or doing breath work. So yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I have, I have come across this. I'm a, Daniel, a ton of times um, over the years where it's because what they're associating with the idea of sitting on the floor, whether it's cross-legged or even laying flat on the floor and they're putting their hand on their belly button to feel their diaphragm rise and fall because they're trying to practice the, the act and the art of bringing the air deep into their, their belly. Um, they've associated that as some sort of level of uh, weakness. And also what I found is a lot of the people who are at, say, that level are terrified of vulnerability. Hmm. And if you're terrified of vulnerability, best of luck having mental toughness. Because it's very easy for someone like me to crack that egg that you've got there. Because it's the equivalent of if I've got a ball in my left hand that's rubber and a ball in my left hand that is glass, well... You look like you're tough on the outside with that glass, but the moment I drop you, you're not bouncing. And so I want to change the association that you've got. And I want to, the very act that you won't do it in front of other people, I want to show to you, I want to change the meaning of that and show you that that's actually a sign of weakness, that you're terrified of vulnerability. Now that's me, like in, in my world, I'm not saying that that's the only way to go about it. Now I have a very in your face coaching style with people, but some of that's born out of the fact that um, I do work with extraordinarily elite people. Some of, the, some of that comes with strong ego and I need that ego to crash on the break of land. <laughs> you know, imagine the ship hitting it, like, because they're coming to me and I'm gonna take my stand and say, I get it, but I'm going to push back on you because that is a sign. That is the thing that's ruling you right now is your concern about what your employees are going to think about you instead of what most people's interpretation is like, what's he doing? That's interesting. Like, what's that about? And then after you do it once, you can let people know, by the way, gang, as a pursuit for me to master the stress levels that are natural inside of this environment, inside of a brokerage firm, inside of my entrepreneurial endeavors or the, the, the C-suite up here. I'm working with a coach to master my breath way more. 
And wow, was I ever astonished at how shallow my breathing was. And ever since I started doing this breath work um, and bringing the air deeper into my body, I have found a level of like focus and relaxation. And so, by the way, if any of you guys want to learn more about this, happy to talk about it. That could be in an email or it can be at the, the team meeting. You're inviting people in to help them level up as well by you showing them some of the things that you're doing. And, and going back to what you said about preparation, you work with reducing anxiety, because if you want to raise performance, you want to reduce anxiety to some, to some degree. To some degree uh, yeah. so, so in that preparation, just knowing that you have a preparation would in itself lower anxiety. So just like breath work, you just by knowing you have the tools, you yeah. reduce anxiety, because if you don't have the tools, you kind of you're left. Uh, OK, maybe I feel good today, maybe not. But just knowing that you have the tools and the preparation, moving from habits to ritual that I know you're a fan of, yeah, you probably lower your anxiety. Is that how you work as well? You 100%. Yeah, like we're, we're both. We're, we're all just trying to give people tools that can raise their performance to a higher level of consistency. But by no stretch of the imaginations is any of this stuff a promise that you get to just go sailing clear across the ocean on calm seas. No, I mean, where the best of the best get tested is when it is very rough. So yes, breath work or meditation skills or the ability to know how to shape shift and use your identity in a different way to help you accelerate through transformational change that needs to happen because of new opportunity or um, a crisis that's happening. All those are great tools. But at the end of the day, I'm not it's, it's those days where you don't feel like it. That's, those are the ones that I'm most interested in. The days where the plan doesn't go the right way. Those are the days I'm really interested in. The days where, you know, after the first seven holes of the, the golf tournament, you've had a bunch of bogeys and you're struggling to keep that ball on the fairway. I'm fascinated by those days, not the days where everything just flowed together. Well, I want more of those than you ever experienced before after coming in contact with our training so that we can set up flow state and, you know, the zone for you more consistently, but you got there mostly because of your preparation, because of the breath work, you're increasing the odds that those things repeatedly show up. So I just find that some people have a bad psychology or level of um, story in their head that they think that it shouldn't have happened that way. Oh, with all the work that I've done at improving myself, why did I have a bad day? Well, because that's the human experience. It's supposed to happen. And so my attitude is I can't wait for the bad days because I can't wait to throw down the ground punch like the Incredible Hulk would or Wonder Woman and send a message to the universe. You came today to fight. Unfortunately for you, you picked the wrong one to fight with. Mm -hmm. And so I'll fight it. So that's a level of attitude that is very much a part of like people who dominate in their kind of uh, careers or in their world. Yeah. Just to add, what's, sorry, what Daniel. Um, in terms of flow state, somebody who's very much trapped in their mind and trapped in thought, and we would look at it, say, from a physiological point of view, that. If they're overly anxious, they have faster breathing, upper chest breathing. The body is telling the brain that the body is not safe. And the brain is launching that individual into that fight or flight response. And all they want to do at that point is to get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody is changing their alter ego, and as a result, they have to remind themselves that this is their persona, how much time do they spend reminding themselves? In other words, could there be a risk that they get lost in thought? Because I know if I go out to do a public talk and to get into that flow state, I want to get the critical mind absolutely out of the way. Sure. I want to be able to bring my full attention onto what I am doing and yeah. with, you know, bringing attention throughout the body into present moment awareness with my attention moving simultaneously with time. Is there, is there a kind of a trade-off between adopting an alter ego or persona 
which is maybe causing you to go into your mind. Now, I don't know, because this is just yeah. fascinating stuff, and I'm trying to tease it, and these may be questions that people might have, versus the ability to bring that stillness, that you have that concentration and attention span that you can literally go through a brick wall. Yeah. Does Great question. It's, it's, it, yeah, it's, I mean, and, and you're not the, the first smart person to ask it that way too, because uh, it would sound like, okay, now I'm kind of moving into the frontal lobe because I'm concentrating on a new, um, new identity. But in the, in the book, I kind of, when I'm walking through the method um, and then I'm walking through the science of why this works so well, because I'm not inventing new psychological switches for you to flick. I'm simply leveraging the stuff that's already born inside of the way that your mind works. So one of the core um, pillars that holds this idea up so well is that in my work, the final kind of golden key that seemed to unlock flow state and zone state was an attitude of playfulness. That's, it's such a critical part and, and people have lost that in whether it's their study of how to become more focused or, you know, get better at, at something is, listen, at the end of the day, um, if you can't have a playful attitude towards the activity that you're doing, then you're going to be kind of, it's a classic gritting your teeth type thing. And as we know, and you guys would know really well too, just physiologically, when the moment you've got tension inside the body, it's like the, the golfer, if he's gripping his club too tight, well, you're losing flexibility and elasticity in your muscles. Um, just like if you clench your teeth, you can't get into the zone and flow state if you've got a closed mouth. You actually can't because this set of muscles that's right here in the jaw area is so connected up into um, the, 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 the facial uh, muscles and behind the the skull that's because a lot of people who have tmj so temporal mandibular yeah. joint issues they get a lot of um whether it's tension so you're headaches saying or, don't do, your teeth shouldn't be in contact there should be some freeway space there which exactly. will, which which we will agree with but yeah um, yeah and so you, you can do it, that. you can do it with nose breathing but i totally get what you're saying yeah this has to be relaxed yeah. in here yeah. yeah um and you know if you take a look at um say uh, Lionel Messi, you take a look at Jordan, you know, his most famous ones, Kobe, who was a client and a friend, um, a lot of their movements and moments or best moments on the court, you know, especially Michael Jordan, you know, he's flying through the air with his tongue hanging out of his mouth. Now, um, you know, he didn't do it strategically. Mm. It was sort of a learned thing really more than anything. But the point about all that is that, um, when you, when you adopt this, you're actually not thinking as much. You're mm. being intentional by when you're going out for that speech, you know, who am I going to embody or like, what, how am I going to show up out there? And, and the reason isn't because you want to be a second rate Hugh Jackman out there. Mm. It's because there's something about the way that Hugh Jackman shows up that you really appreciate. It's his playful attitude. If you've ever seen him in interviews, he's super yep. charismatic super engaging. And, and so that's what you want. It's not that you want to be, well, I mean, heck, I wouldn't mind having his pecs as well. So whatever, but, um, uh, but it's, it's that I want to show up like that. So it's his superpowers that like the character traits or the qualities that he's showing up with. So in, and because the mind works so fast, that's why the power of these little totems, like, you know, I'll be in the middle of a talk and, um, even if I am so caught in flow state, there's, there's these little check-in moments that I might have where I might grab my glasses and it's like a micros, microsecond, a milliseconds of time where just the thought flashes up of like, this is who I am out here. This is who I am out, out here. Mm. Now, I've been doing this for so long that it's so much faster for me. So yes, in the beginning, there is a practicing state, right? Like, I mean, I, I don't tell people this is some sort of like, magic bullet that you know the moment you read the book and you get the, you get your alter ego your, your first alter ego is going to be the perfect alter ego for you um but it is a it just like i said it's a tool and a mechanism to unshackle yourself from who you think that you are because mm. that's not even true so right? it's like, almost that you're you're so comfortable in your own skin adopting this new persona that you don't have to take yourself too seriously yeah yeah well and i mean i'd probably 
we'd probably agree that that's, that's a big problem for a lot of people. They really do take them. They take themselves really seriously. And one of the things that I, I like to do is I, I, I love to just break the psychological paradigms that so many people have adopted from spiritual practice, educational practices, you know, leadership books, personal development books that are fundamentally untrue. One of them being the idea of authentic self. Okay. Mm. Or authenticity, terrible terms that are being used nowadays as a way to posture that somehow you're showing up in a way that you get to excuse away, sometimes being rude to someone else. Those two words, authenticity and authentic, were not meant to be used in subjective realities, subjective terms, meaning human beings. Human beings are subjective. We're not an object. So, you know, if, if someone has, a Louis Vuitton bag, you might say, oh, is that an authentic one? Mm. Or is that a fake one? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and so I just came back from Turkey and I bought my, my wife some bags. And her first question was, oh, are these, <laughs> are these real? <laughs> you know, or are they, are they authentic? But to use those terms when, you, when um, putting them on a human being is just categorically false. And it's dangerous because there is no an authentic you. There isn't, there can't be, because we are simply a storehouse of capabilities, qualities, and attributes. Most of you that are listening are simply living through the habitual nature of someone that you didn't even shape. Because last time I checked, we didn't choose our parents. We didn't choose the country that we grew up in. We didn't choose the religion that we were raised inside of, possibly. We didn't choose the network of friends that we had around us because I wasn't paying for my house last time I checked when I was five years old. And yet, from the ages of six months to seven years of age, which is the most critical part of the development of a human's idea of the world around them and their self, you had no control. You had no control. And, but that is a lot of the baked goodness that is the foundation that you're standing on thinking that that's who you are. Isn't that interesting? Mm. That so much of what I think that I am is born out of stuff that I had no control over. And that's one of the most important parts of being an adult and maturing into being an adult is the realization that you can reshape yourself into being anything that you want. Do you, go that, into that, Todd, do you go into that as, I know up to the age of seven, that you kind of download information as a kid and yeah. through subconscious. Do you talk about the conscious versus the subconscious and the power it holds on you uh, and how you break free from that uh, later on? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I go into it in the book, but again, I don't dive deep into that world of like unconscious beliefs and stuff like that um, because the success rate of therapists, I'm not a therapist. I'm a performance guy. I am all about helping you get better and improving. So that's an advancement thing. Yeah. Um, and I am wholly unqualified <laughs> to do therapy work with you. That is not what my education or my pursuits have been about. But don't forget that the stats on therapy, psychoanalysis, any of that world, the success rate is around 29%. So these are the most qualified people around helping people with traumas or belief issues, et cetera. And their success rate is 29%. Okay. And so some of that is born out of the fact that we know very little still about the six inches between our ears. It is still very much an undiscovered country. So when people make grand statements about, oh, that's a belief issue for you. I want to pump the brakes. I just want to say, I don't know that that's a belief issue that you have. I don't know that to be true. Let's first take a look at your environment because it might be the world around you that's actually causing this under indexing with your performance. You're just around terrible people. You're working inside of, inside of a bad company. The company has given you really bad resources in order for you to execute your job. You're actually quite competent, quite good. And because you're getting bad results right now, you're making it about you. And it's not you. It's actually the tools and the resources you have around you. So 
to answer your question around subconscious, I'm very cautious about making something a subconscious issue with people because I, the metaphor I give people is it's the equivalent of the spider's web. And I don't want to pluck a string that doesn't need to be plucked in order to cause some new little demon to show up that didn't need to be um, made aware that you even have an issue. The environment, Daniel, is very interesting and Todd, um, because you can imagine a kid growing up in, in one location, we'll say a small country town. Mm -hmm. And we say that that child, that child is going to act almost as true the wishes and commands of everybody else in that town, their peers, yeah. the pressures on that kid. And that kid is acting through all of this. And sometimes the best thing for this kid is to get out of that town and to be able to go into a new town where nobody knows them mm -hmm. and they can start off from afresh and be who they want to be. That's right. Um, do you take people out of their environment? So you're really looking about the physical environment yeah, it's, it's, it's that big. Yeah, it's, it's huge. So um, it's, it's, it's funny. I've probably put more people into improv classes than who, as a guy who doesn't sell improv classes, what, what than do you anyone. Mean by improv? Improv is um, uh, basically like an acting or a comedy class where you're on stage okay. and you're learning to improvise in the moment. Okay. So there's a couple of reasons why I want to do that. Um, one, I want people to see through experience just how gifted they actually are or just how competent they actually are to handle an extremely uncertain situation. Because when people get that sinew on their muscle, when they actually feel like, oh, I can handle really mm -hmm. weird situations when the a uh, teacher in the audience yells out, okay, everyone on stage, you're now a farm animal. Everyone get down. And so now, well, that person's a horse and I'm walking around like a goose and that person's a, a duck or whatever. It gets you out of this. It, you get to embody something different. So, you know, th that physicality, like I've got NBA players, National Football League flick football players. Walking and around like, as a sheep. Yeah, well, yeah. if that was the act, yeah, 100%. Um, <laughs> But so my, uh, my point is, is to get to your thing around environment, I want to change up and get people new experiences, give them some new context so they can play around and see some new sides of themselves. Because in my normal world, I'm such a serious person. I show up and I've got the, you know, the, the blazer on and the button up shirt and all that. But when I'm at improv class, I'm not that person because I want people to start to expand their sense of self concept that, yes, you've habitually been showing up that way. And that particular type of persona that you have of the guy in the blazer and the button up shirt and the glasses on might be successful in that world. But at some point in time, you're going to hit a ceiling. It's not going to work for you anymore. You're going to hit a plateau. And so the more experiences that you have and that you can draw on saying, you know what, man, when I was doing that improv class, it, you can borrow that skill set in the next transformation of your career. Does that make sense? Yeah. And they actually, yeah. in Sweden, there was a, a football team or a soccer team that actually a few years ago did that very successfully because they had a team from in the middle of Sweden, but nationalities from all over the world. Yeah. And they did some improv theater to kind of bring them together, whatever the coach was trying to do. Yeah. But Sweden is a really interesting country because you have something called the Yanta law where everybody's supposed to be equal. And for me mm -hmm. personally, moving from a country like that to New York City, where it's kind of like not the complete opposite, but to yeah. a large degree. So it's almost like not just as a person, but as a country, you have the these, you're supposed to make the same amount of money, look the same, act the same, same expectations of life, whatever. Then you move to New York City, you have this, uh, uh, you know, people from all over the world. So your, yeah. your view, your physical view, everything changes uh, of what to expect. It's a very, very interesting. So I'm not sure if you're aware of that about Swedes, that they're very like that, but Oh, oh, yeah. Well, it, I was going to say to you before we even started this, when you had mentioned that you're from Sweden, I was going to say, well, actually, as a as a national nationality, my favorite clients um, were Swedes or okay. typically <laughs> from the scan. I mean, you know, I did a lot of work. I mean, I lived in Copenhagen or Copenhagen. Yeah, um, Copenhagen, right across here, yeah. about 10 miles away from me. 
so the great thing about that's that Scandinavian world is um, more so than most other countries, you over index towards intellectual thought, right? I mean, okay. Nobel prize comes out of um, this okay. world too. Okay. And so the mental game, because it, it does have some elements of intellectuality to it. They were always some of my best clients. There were, um, you know, whether it's, you know, Marcus Nasland or, um, you know, insert the name of, you know, tons of other NHL hockey players are always some of the best at embracing the concept. But um, yeah, like, I mean, that's why I love meeting expats, like people who are from one country, but they're living in like or immigrants, you yep. know, they're just, I mean, everyone that's listening should have at least, I think, three immigrants as, as good friends, because you'll see that, they just think very, very differently. Um, they have a lot less fear um, because in order for you to go from one country to another, um, even like going as a Canadian moving down to the to the States, even though most people think that they look like the same countries, well, you're also starting over from scratch. You've got no credit rating, no one yeah. like, I mean, there's, and, and we are culturally extraordinarily different countries. So yeah. mm. and one, one thing that is fascinating, I know we talk a lot, a lot about when you talk about the top, top performers, the habits to rituals, yeah. you know, getting the deep meaning, I completely understand that, and also discipline. But it seems like also having you know, joy and fun is very important. And yeah. discipline and fun is sometimes for a lot of people a paradox. How do you explain that, that it's so important to have, have fun, but at the same time, if you want to be at the top, discipline and deep meaning, how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you mix that? It's, a, it's such a personal thing for each person. Um, so I won't say his name, uh, but one of the, he's always considered on the top three or top five greatest football players in um, National Football League history. And um, he is someone who is extraordinarily disciplined. Um, and another teammate of his, who's also considered one of the greatest football players to ever play was same career in that, you know, probably the best in his category, very disciplined, worked hard as well, but he had a ton of fun. The other guy, um, very disciplined, but his attitude was that in order for me to have success, I also need to be very serious too. And I need yeah. to take it seriously. He's, he's well known as being, not being a very good teammate, yeah. very judgmental. Um, you're not working hard enough. Whereas the other guy sort of, no, you can, come on, we can push harder than this. He was very much, um, he welcomed people into his world. Whereas the other guy, very disciplined, serious, he wanted to break everybody. Like he wanted to impress everyone. And so some of it comes down to just, your own personal philosophies and your attitudes is, is what's going to take the idea of discipline and either magnify it into something that can be powerful and inviting and joyful for other people too, or it's going to turn it into something that, oh, look at what that guy's sacrificing. You know, he won't even have a kernel of popcorn during the off season because he needs to be so strict. Um, and, um, and I know that the first guy that I was talking about, he wouldn't admit it, but he really didn't have that much fun in his 17 year career in the national football league. Whereas the other guy, I mean, he was basically a dancing machine on the field half the time. I mean, in between plays. Um, so it's uh, discipline does not mean that you're sacrificing joy by any stretch of imagination, because it's the way that you bring your attitude to the concept of discipline that can either magnified into something that's very inviting or turn it into something that's like, oh man, that guy's a beast, but I don't want to do that. Yeah. Does that, think, kinda, does that yeah. make sense for you? Yeah. And yeah. I think there was also, I think it's also was a, a podcast on the Flow Research Collective talking about Navy SEALs and the power of humor to withstand hell week. Mm -hmm. Somebody said something, you know, and that, that pushed, you know, that made a lot of people make it through that week. And yeah. to be able to shift between that seriousness and discipline to humor and back i think it's it's for me a, a tremendous power so that's why i was asking the, the question yeah. Yeah. and as a leader too like just knowing how to bring levity to a situation right like knowing how to bring uh, a fun attitude to something that could be serious 
Yeah. And again, timing is everything with some of this stuff, just like yeah. any good comedian would be as well. But uh, and it's not, you know, not to say that joy is about being the funny person, but um, uh, you know, so much of, of joy is born out of knowing how to really enjoy the process. I mean, so like I, my kind of definition for people on peak performance is, you know, in my world, yes, I want to help you reach outcomes that you didn't expect. I want you to hit milestones that you're um, uh, uh, shooting towards, but I also want you to enjoy the process because if you can't do that, I mean, then yeah. why are we doing it? Yeah. And, and because when you get to that goal, if your only pursuit is the goal, it's such an empty feeling yeah. because you, you get there. And I mean, the number of, uh, this is always a surprising thing. Um, most people don't realize that uh, a very large portion of the people standing on top of the podiums at the Olympics are actually going through a state of depression in the moment because their minds are already going to, now what? Because if the only pursuit was to get up there, it's such an empty feeling for so many people. And I know that because I've talked to those people as they've come back to their dorm rooms or their Olympic room, wherever they're staying about this extreme void that they are experiencing at, at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know, I know not, not from that specific, yeah, those specific events, but after the career, right after yeah. or at the tail end, when they stop, they, there is a you know ton of athletes who have depression problems right after because you know they the, the habits and rituals they all go away yeah. and they don't know what to do and th there is i don't know if you work with athletes after the career as well because uh, yeah 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 that was a big that was kind of that became one of the other um large group of athletes that would come in. I mean, I was so young early on. I was, I was typically working with the younger athletes. And then as my career progressed and my company grew and stuff, then, you know, the, the audience expanded and stuff. And that was kind of one of the big things, you know, when you're so well known for basically work around identity, which is what the alter ego, you know, yep. concept helps with what you're talking about is even though they're losing their habits and their routines of, of being that athlete, really what they've lost is a sense of identity. They've only described and seen themselves as a, you know, a downhill skier, an alpine racer, or they've only seen themselves as a soccer player or a football player or whatever. Um, and now it's, well, now that I don't have that activity that I can define myself with, now who am I? Now yeah. what am I? And so my, my strategy was always, well, let's get way ahead of that. Let's start building up that new identity um, two years before you retire or three years or whatever, or even during your career, we're working on making sure that we're sort of bifurcating or dissecting and seeing that, listen, like even let, I'll use me as an example right now. Like, so here I am doing the podcast with you guys right now. And, you know, but I'm a CEO in my company, um, but I'm also a coach and I speak on stages and I write books and stuff. Well, all of those are actually separate identities. That's not my, I don't think of that as one identity called career guy. Mm -hmm. Because what it takes for me to be a great CEO and leader for my team is a different set of skills than an author. And so I'm very good at shape-shifting and being intentional as to when I sit in that chair over there and I'm going to write something for my upcoming book, I'm thinking about who's the author that's sitting down? Who am I inspired by as the author? Who am I inspired by then in the identity of being a CEO? So when you start to see that you've got many roles in life, you can start to play with each one uh, more intentionally. So I was, the point I was going to get to was, but as me as a coach and kind of like how I show up in my world as being a challenger personality, like kind of breaking through some paradigms for people. And, you know, also I love to just, I, I do, I love to kind of um, break down the, you know, cultural or societal paradigms that people live through that are just not true because they keep on consuming information from influencers or people who haven't done it. I'm a, that's why I like talking to you guys. You're practitioners. You're nodding along with me because you're like, yep, I can remember this client. Yep, exactly that one. Because you're working with people every day and you know how difficult it is for people to get involved in breath work. You already use the example to the mm -hmm. CEO who's terrified of doing the breath work in his office, even though that's what you asked him to do because he has to do it twice a day, but it's at four o'clock in the afternoon and that's when everyone's walking by my office and I've got glass windows and, you know, Yep. That's reality. That's, and I love talking to people because I'd be fascinated to hear of some of the ideas you've given people. 
Now, having said all that, when I walk out this door and I'm around my three little kids, is Todd only about being a challenger personality type? Or is that just a useful set of qualities that helps me to succeed in my role? Well, it's the latter. It's a useful set of qualities that allows me to succeed in my role. But when I'm around my kids, I don't wear my glasses around them. That's a part of my uniform in my business. But when I'm around them, I have a little bracelet that my two daughters, Molly and Sophie, made me. It has their initials on it, along with my boy, Charlie. And it has my, my, my wife, uh, Valerie's name on it as well. And I leave it outside my door, and it's on a hook. And now I'm crossing through a new threshold. I'm entering a new stage of my life. And on that stage, the performance I want to give is to show up as someone, the character on that stage is someone who's kind and playful and patient and fun and caring and loving. All qualities I want my three little kids to experience. And so I put on that little bracelet and who I'm trying to embody is one of my heroes, Mr. Rogers, who's well known in America, in Canada, um, as a, you know, he's an amazing children's entertainer. And if you, there's, you know, Tom Hanks just played him in a movie. There's an amazing documentary about him, but I grew up watching his children's shows. And I can't think of anyone better than Mr. Rogers and my own dad as the blend of my alter ego for how I want to show up. And so that alter ego is a mental model when you think about it. Mm -hmm. Now I have a clear image of what I'm trying to move towards. And you, you both know this because of breath work, right? We're trying to help people visualize things. Well, when 70% of your brain is de dedicated to the visual cortex and you're trying to move into a future self and it's very vague, makes it difficult. But that's why the alter ego is such a powerful concept because it's a clear image. I want to be more like that. Not so that I can have a career like Mr. Rogers, but so I can show up like him around my kids because I don't want myself to believe that I am only a challenger personality type because I work 10 hours a day flexing the muscle of that identity. How, how do you handle that now in the last two years with, with Corona working from home that a lot of people do or where you tell clients that work from home that kids come home, you get a work email, your wife comes home, so you can't segregate your identity and your roles as clearly maybe as you used to be. So you kind of, they're intertwined. Yeah. How yeah. do you, how do you mix that? Or do you need to take one role or how, yeah. How do you yeah. do it? Um, so I'm very good at educating my kids as to, cause it's my job to also teach them about identity and see that. And so that they can see that there's many sides of them as well. Cause I say like, well, there's, so I'll take my daughter, Sophie, for example, um, there's, family Sophie. There's the Sophie that hangs out around here. And then there's the Sophie that's with friends. And I'll bet you're a little bit different when you're with your friends, aren't you? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, do you ever feel like around the family, you can lose your patience or you can get angry with us or whatever and stuff different than when you're around your friends. And she's like, oh, hundred percent. Now, is that bad though? I mean, around your family, the reason that you can do that is because you feel the most safe here. So I'm already trying to teach them about that they've got different sides of themselves. And it's okay to be like that. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to be the parent who says, but you're so much better when you're around your teacher at school than you are at home. <laughs> mm. No, it makes sense. That's okay. Um, but when I say is like, when daddy goes inside this specific room, this is who he's showing up to be like. And it's because the work I need to do in there needs that kind of person. And then when I'm around you, I want to be really like this. Now I need your help though. If I don't ever show up like that, what I want you to say is, is that the way that Mr. Rogers would do it? Right? And because I tell them how I'm trying to show up. So if they ever walk through the door and I'm on a podcast like this, how am I going to respond in that moment? Yeah. I'm going to give my look because every morning, 8.02 a.m., I've always got calls at eight o'clock in the morning with my team, or sometimes it's, and I don't tell him not to do it. He's only five. He just wants to come and give dad a kiss goodbye and give him a hug. He's a sweet little guy sometimes. <laughs> and, um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll switch. But what you're talking about, the actual term is called role conflict. Yeah. So we have different roles 
And sometimes they collide because the pursuit that you have in work and the pursuit that you have as a dad or a mom or something, they collide at times. And there's no apologies for that. That's life. I can't say that the alter ego concept is going to solve that flawlessly and perfectly for you. But the more that I can talk to my own family about it, they understand that, oh, when they see dad in there, no wonder he looks, oh, no, he's kind of different. So th this brings us to Patrick, something that we, we talk a lot about focus and awareness, being aware in the role that you are, you know, you're moving from place mm -hmm. to place from mom to dad to CEO, whatever, but building, building up one identity, what would you suggest building up one? I'm assuming not too many at the same time. Would yeah. you pick one that you're really bad at or strengthening something you're really good at to move that further? Which one? Would you Daniel, it's, it's almost like you're ready to start delivering the workshops because that's a lot of the <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, So what I say to people, I even say in the book, like, um, uh, so before you go and start building a bunch of alter egos for yourself, let's just start with one. Yeah. And um, now there's two ways to go about this. Probably even more ways, but the two I'm going to give you are, now that we know that, yes, there's many roles that I play, that's helpful. Um, what's the role that you've got right now that you're most frustrated with your performance on? Okay. What's the one where you feel like is most kind of trapping you in that you're not showing up like you most want to. Okay. So we could go with one there, or it could be, which role do you want to start having more fun with? Like you want to start having more like playfulness with, um, because that's another angle that you could take with it, you know, and, and typically the ones that people are most frustrated with are the ones that probably would have the largest impact on the quality of their life. So, I did, um, you, you, I'm sure you're both familiar with um, YPO, which is the Young Presidents Organization you know, around the world. Um, you know, Everyone that's in there typically has to have a business that's $15 million or more, CEOs, leaders, and there's billionaires in there. And I was speaking to the, um, the LA, the Los Angeles um, YPO group, a couple of billionaires in there. And I did my little keynote, my song and dance about alter egos. And um, I ended it by reading my children's book. So my alter ego effect book came out. And then I came out with the book a year later on its anniversary called my super me, which is the children's book, kind of the, the, the value proposition in a kid's form for, for youngsters. And I read it to everyone. And, um, and then I told everyone about, you know, Mr. Rogers and me and trying to be a dad and stuff. And, you know, two guys, both worth a lot of money came up to me afterwards. They said, I was, I was following along with the old alter ego thing and it resonated with like some points along my, my pathway to where I've gotten. Um, and it made a lot of sense. And I was thinking about building out, okay, well, where in my business would I build out an alter ego? Cause we all go there. Like typically ambitious people go towards how can I make money with this <laughs> um, type of thing. And they said, but when you start talking about being a dad, that, that is where I'm most under indexing in my life is is that area and so probably the the largest um point of feedback that i've gotten from people that have read the book or have engaged with the concept is i thought i was coming in to build this alter ego or for this help but it was this one over here that i really needed help with and it's and it's around a lot of times family and, and being more intentional as a husband or a wife to someone yeah mm -hmm. that, that's fascinating I, it's brilliant I, uh, just to round off, because I mean, we spent an hour and I have, I have a million more questions, but Patrick. Uh, no, uh, it's, um, I think it was absolutely brilliant. Great conversation yeah. and uh, is, enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah, Todd, yeah. your book is behind you. Do you want to show us what your book is, the cover? Yeah. Um, so it is uh, The Alter Ego Effect, The Power of Secret Identities to Transform Your Life. Um, Oh, Daniel, you have same, a, same almost all, and I, almost I, I, the same I, I, color. but almost the same color as that comic book as your book, Patrick. So <laughs> yellow is good. That's Maybe Todd is my alter ego, Daniel. Yeah. I didn't even know it, you know. <laughs> well, when I was when I was thinking about what color I should have for my book, that was long before it, it was back in 2017, 2018 and stuff when we were coming up with the, the concept art. And I went to Barnes and Noble in um, Union Square in New York City which is the largest bookstore at the time, I believe in the world. And I walked through and I'm like, man, there's not a lot of yellow books. Yellow is going to be the color of the book. It jumps and then, straight off the shelf. Yeah. But then <laughs> in the, in the two months that my book came out, there was five other yellow books amongst <laughs> even friends of mine um, uh, that, that came out as well. So anyway, um, yeah. 
That's great. Well, well it's a fascinating conversation. Yeah, I thank you so much, Todd. I really enjoyed it and uh, hope to hope to have you uh, on a uh, board. We'll, we'll have to do a part two. We'll have to yeah. do a part two, guys. Um, but yeah, no, I love I love jamming with people like yourselves that are out there, you know, bringing like, I mean, breathwork is a great example of another such a, such a specific thing. But I mean, it's one of those core, core, like um, uh, rituals, habits, routines, skills, really, um, that I've been working with people on for 25 years now, too, is it's the stuff. proper use of breath, right? Great stuff. I'll, we'll send you on some of the books. Um, Todd, if people are looking for you, what's your website? I'm sure it's toddherman.com, is it? Uh, not quite. Um, ToddHerman.com was, I think, like the 72nd um, registered domain name on the internet. So he got it before me. Uh, consulted. <laughs> so it's ToddHerman.me is my kind of home base on the interwebs. Okay. And from there, you can, or AlterEgoEffect.com is, you know, for the book. And, but, you know, and you can find all my links on social media. So the only thing I'd say so, is like, if you listen to this, um, I love it when people say, Hey, heard you with Patrick and Daniel, um, love the conversation. So tag me on Twitter or LinkedIn, or, you know, even just DM uh, as well. So appreciate stuff. it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much.